What's up, everybody? I'm in a uh, shamble, a shamble of a studio right now. We got a lot of stuff in here. And that's because uh, we were very busy shooting a Christmas special. Oh, we were busy. Today, today is the 12th. We're hoping this thing comes out on the 17th. That's what we're hoping. Otherwise, it might come out on the 19th. But the 17th, I would love to do. Let me tell you what we did. We have a bunch of amazing comedians tell funny Christmas stories. We have music from a very talented friend of mine, Suzanne Santo. Dan Soder. Laura Bites. Jesus Trejo. Nick Thune. Deborah D. Giovanni. It's the best. It's the best. We make my mom's shrimp my aunt little shrimp dip we make a gingerbread house we make cocktails you don't want to make anything with my mom's we shop for vintage plateware because that's what dudes do anyway that's why this place is a mess how is everyone doing dude i don't know what i said last week this is how pathetic i am do you want to know how pathetic i am i'll tell you i was just with friends for coffee brought this home alana's that's my local and I was like, hey, I want to get someone to, like, put a little heat behind this Christmas special just to get, like, you know, let people know about it and get people to write about it. And they're like, yeah. I'm like, do you know any PR people? And they're like, yeah. So they give me these PR people. And I look at the first one. I'm like, God, I feel like I know that person. And I didn't think anything of it. Then I look, look to see if I have their email and my email address. I don't. So I just call. She picks up. I'm like, hey, I'm like, this is Jay Larson, blah, 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 blah. I know my friends recommended you. And she's like, Jay, I know you. <laughs> like, we've worked together before. And I was like, ah, I'm so stupid. I'm not bright. That's for sure. I never, ever remember that stuff. Ever. Um, anyway, jlarsoncomedy.com, Jay Larson Comedy on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um. I mentioned last week how comments on the special help, and so many of you went over there, and I really appreciate that. And people are still watching it, and I hope that more people watch it. So just thank you so much for that. And I hope the same thing happens with this Christmas special. I hope that we get this bad boy cranked out, and you guys are stoked for it, and you watch it, and you share it, and other people like it, and then they share it. Because I think it's going to be fun. I don't think anyone's really done anything like this, you know, because they're probably not dumb enough or think that anyone will care enough. But I give a fucking care, dude. There's stop animation. There's regular animation. There's this. There's that. A lot of stuff. And there's so many great people have been helping out on it. So we'll see. We'll see. We want to get the best product out there. So I want the 17th. We'll see what happens. Um, man, does it, isn't it insane that today's the 11th for me, 12th for you. Christmas is like, I mean, if you, if you celebrate Hanukkah, you're in it right now. Brought a Hanukkah gift to a friend yesterday. You know what I realized? I've never been like a, here's the deal. Someone does something nice for you, right? And you're like, oh my God, that was so thoughtful, right? And you're like, God, that's so cool. I've never been that guy. I'm not that I'm not thoughtful. I I think I think I am. I just maybe don't act on it or don't take that extra step. Or ready? Realize it's not that much work to be thoughtful. Because it feels like it you have to do a lot of work to be thoughtful when you don't. And let me give you an example. So I have this really good buddy of mine, and we golf together all the time. And every now and then we'll go to a screening together or we'll go out to dinner. Um, but usually it's always golf or some sort of screening or something that has to do with like film, TV or comedy. Right. And he's moving to Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires for a month. And he's gotten me like sometimes we'll just go to golf and he's like, yeah, I got this book for you. I thought you'd dig it. You know, I'm like, oh, dude, it's the greatest. He's like, I golf with a lot of different people, but this guy, 
you guys obviously know I have more interest out than just comedy. You know what I mean? There's other things I like, and I like to talk about them. I just can't talk about one thing all the time. I just can't. Like, I was thinking the other day, I'm like, why have you never really, like, pushed the angle of sports more in your career? Because I love sports. Every single day I listen to sports talk. I'm on ESPN.com. It's the only website I go to. I go to, like, four websites. That's one of them. Two I can't mention. Um, just kidding. Um, but it's. I just was like, oh, because I guess I don't want my whole life to just be one thing. I don't know why. It's just, like, to me, it's... I don't know. I don't want to be trapped into one idea or one thing. And something I love about when I golf with this buddy of mine is that we talk about family. We talk about his single life. We talk about comedy. We talk about his work projects because he's got a number of them. We talk about golf. We talk about sports. We talk about what activities we've like taken part in. So he's going to Buenos Aires. And I was like, man, I'm not going to. Like, he's going to go for a month. I'm like, oh, man, we're not going to see each other. We should try and get a golf session in. So he's like, yeah, do you want to golf this day? I was like, yeah. Now, leading up to that, there was like, shot the Christmas special. Then it was once, all you have no idea how much stuff, because we used friends' locations as sets, all that stuff is here. You know what I mean? It's in my garage or in my house. So I, I had to spend, after three days of shooting, clean my house. And the next day was like, organize everything. And then then I was like, well, now I'm going to clean out a bunch of shit. For me, I feel like a great time to donate is at the holidays, right before the holidays. Because I, I feel like, I don't know, donation centers are going to be like looking for stuff. Because that's when places that are going to give to other people. I, I don't know. We I just want to get it all out and get it donated. Um, and it was great for our kids to like show them like, yeah, we're getting rid of that now. That's not going to be here anymore. And they're like, why? Because, well, we're fortunate that we have stuff. Some people don't and it's the holidays and that's what we're doing. They get it in general, but sometimes, you know, they're just like, I don't want to let go of that. And you're like, shut up. You're letting go. So he's going to Buenos Aires and I had a work thing. So that was Friday after the cleanup on Thursday, organized on Friday. Saturday was family all day, show at night. Sunday was family. Then I had to go host an event at be there at four till nine. Then Monday I played in this charity golf tournament and then I was seeing him on Tuesday. And I was like, man, I, I, I want to get him like a gift, you know, like something. And this is where like a little effort, okay goes a long way this is where hanukkah comes into play hanukkah is his his holiday um so i was able to get him something that's at hanukkah anyway the point is i was jammed up and i'm like what am i gonna do and i got this gift bag from the golf tournament i'm like i grab a couple things out of here you know it was like a portable speaker and a water bottle i'm like i give him these like as if i could spin it into the story that these are uh how many of you right now are like, what a piece of shit? What a piece? He's just going to re-gift. Yeah, I was going to re-gift, dude. I was going to re-gift. I didn't, but it was in my head. I'm like, I want to give. You know, what does it matter anyway? What does re-gifting matter anyway? Yeah, I got a gift. No, I didn't want it. Yes, you would want it. Did I give it to you? Yes. Did I pretend that I got it? I don't know. Did I? I All I did was give it to you. I never said that I went out and purchased it. Does it look brand new? It's because it is. The fuck are you complaining about? It's a gift. I'll re-gift if I want to re-gift. You know what? And that's it. And anyone who ever gets a gift from me going forward, just know. Maybe it was a gift to me first. <laughs> anyway. I just, because he's always, he does things, he's gotten me gifts and books that were personal. And when someone does something that's like, uh, shows thoughtfulness, that's the word, because he actually used it when he opened the gift that I got him. Thoughtfulness. When people do things that show that you put thought into them and that you were thoughtful, it just like, it it's like amazing. It just feels so good, doesn't it? When someone does something, you're like, oh man, you... You thought about me, and then you followed through. Because anyone can get a gift. You can re-gift whatever it is that you're going to do. And this is where my final point is coming from. (laughs) 
is this. So I'm golfing with him at 11. The night before, I'm like, I don't want to give him these fucking things. I want to get him, like, books on Buenos Aires so that when he's there, he can explore. You know, that that's it means something. But I'm like, you can't go to a bookstore, you know. I got home from this event at, like, 9. I can't go out to a bookstore, and I didn't want to. So I looked online, and the one of the Barnes & Nobles opened at 9 o'clock, okay? Now... There's two of them. There's one by me, but I'm going to go the wrong direction from golf. I'd have to get there at 9. We're golfing at 11. It's a 45-minute drive to golf. This is what happens in L.A. That's what's going to be the case. So even if I left my house at 845, which I couldn't because I had to wait with my daughter for my wife to get home from dropping my son so that she could take him, her, to school, I couldn't leave. I, you know, So I wouldn't be able to get there till 9, like 10, then get the stuff then get on the road. Now it's going to take a little longer. I just didn't like it. So there was a Barnes & Noble. That was in direction to golf. A little out of the way. I leave at 9 o'clock. I get on the phone. This is where I like technology. I mean, this isn't even technology. It's a phone. I call. I get someone on the phone. Guy was so nice. I'm like, hey, man, can, I, can you put me in touch with someone and travel? I don't know. Something about it felt good. You know what I mean? Just to call a bookstore. I'm like, yeah, can I get a... Yeah, can I talk to somebody in the travel section, please? They're like, ooh, where are you going? I'm like, well, nowhere. It's actually for a friend. But in case you were wondering, he's going to Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. Check. Okay. Um, so I was like, yeah, I want these books. My friend's going to Buenos Aires. He's like, oh, we have this and this and this. And I was like, I like that one. I go, I don't want something like let's go Buenos Aires. I want something that's like a little more like – off the beaten path, something that's, you know, which I'm sure it, it all feels off the beaten path because you're in Buenos Aires. But, like, think about your town and think about if you were wanted people to get, like, the coolest thing when they went to town, you think you would tell them to go to a fucking TGA Fridays? No. You would be like, dude, you know where you got to go? I Instagrammed out today this pizza place, Mulberry Street Pizza in Beverly Hills. It's my favorite. You just feel like you're somewhere else. Anyway, the guy's like, yeah, I got two books. I'm like, can you do me a favor? Can you can I pay for them now? And then can you wrap them? And I can just walk in and pick them up. He's like, yeah. He's like, you want holiday wrapping paper or birthday? I'm like, you got Hanukkah? He's like, yep. I go, bro, do it. So I roll in there. It's paid for and wrapped. I grab it. I walk out. I get to the golf course 30 minutes before we got to play which is great. I get to hit some balls. I grab some breakfast. You know, we're held up on like the second tee. I give him the gift. And he's just like, dude, this is so thoughtful. One, he's just like, you don't celebrate Hanukkah. Doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. And two, like I thought about the fact that he's going on this trip. Here's the point. He thinks I'm the most thoughtful guy. I did it that day. And I've always had this problem, like, I always think, like, in order to be thoughtful, you have to think in advance, you got to do this thing. You don't. You can pull things together, and it goes a long way for people. Jesus. You know what doesn't go a long way? How long it took me to tell you guys the point of that. But I think that's my whole thing, is like, uh, listen, you can just, we don't have to, if you're like me, and you think it has to be this giant ordeal, to do things it doesn't you can just all you need to do is dial yourself in rock and roll and make it all happen and that's what i did and it felt great i played really well too by the way if you golf 60 to 70 yards right now i'm on fire i'm on fire i'm going hard at the pin i'm not feeling like because it's an in-between distance for those of you out there who don't golf you got you can have a strong distance from like 110, 115. Then you start getting lower than that. Those are like in between distance. So like when I say if you're 155, everyone has a club in their bag, they hit full strength 150, 140, anything like that. Once you get under 100, there's no club that you hit full strength that's 50, 60, 70. Then you have your smaller wedges. And I've just been going like 85% 58 degree at 70 yards nasty backspin going past the flag sucking it back oh anyway i was on fire with that <sighs> fell apart a little bit but i shot an 80 whatever you guys am i bragging a little bit
here's something else that happened to me. So I can't deal. My wife does this sometimes. And I, I, I don't blame her because she, she works in a business setting. And I feel like, and I might be wrong for those of you who work in a business setting, you got to assert yourself if you're going to be heard. I mean, that's probably life in general. But like even in the business world, like when you're on calls, if you have a point across, like we, you only have so much time in a day. So on calls, if someone's going to start talking about something that like you're like, oh, this is just a waste of time. Let me say this and then you'll understand why you don't need to say it. I don't know what how it works out. But like sometimes when she'll just be like this, Jay, and she just raises her voice so that she can just talk. And I'll just be like, fuck are you doing? What are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, are we in a are we in a boardroom? I don't understand. We have we have time here. I can have my feelings and thoughts, and you can have your feelings and thoughts, and then we'll laugh about it, and then we, you know. But I was at I was in this meeting, and these people were doing that, and like I am, I listen. I talk a lot. That's why I do my podcast by myself now, so I don't have to worry about anyone else. I'm like, oh, I can get out what I want to what I want to say and I don't have to worry about talking over a guest or talking over a co-host or anything like that because I find that I I'm always like a back down guy I'm like oh I'll take the back seat yeah go ahead I'll let that person go like if I'm in conversation with you and I have I'm got a, getting trying to get a point out there but you're interrupting me you keep interrupting you ever had that and someone interrupts and then then you wait and here comes your moment and then someone else interrupts because they're responding to that person and then that person and then you get interrupted again I've had tons of people that go through and they're like, all right, what were you saying? I'm like, nah, it's good. I'm like, we're kind of past it. Like, cause at that point I'm just like, nah, it's like some things are timing based. You know what I mean? Like now we're on, we're off to something else. We don't need it. What I was going to say, I'll think of it. And they'll be like, no, 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 go ahead. And I, and I want to be like, in my head, I'm like, it's no big deal. I'm not upset. I'm just like, yeah, we'll just move on. And they're like, no, go ahead. And I'm like, it, listen, it's gone now. I will think of other creative and fun things to say. That was one of them. The moment's passed. Let's move on. Anyway, I was with friends today. This was a couple days ago. Or was it? It was today, but I don't. you think they're watching? They're not watching. They're not listening. So I'll just say it. They're a duo, okay? There's two of them, and they're a duo. And they chat. And they're like twins. They're finishing. They talk. You're, you, you don't know where to look. You're like, who the fuck is talking? They're both talking. They'll talk at the same time, and you're looking, and you're like, <clears throat> you guys are talking at the same time here. I don't know what to do. And, like, you know, you can only – it's a, it's a hard bombardment. You ever get in that situation? Like, you're talking, you're – why the fuck are you both talking right now? And you're just like, well, well, well. Finally, I just pulled my wife. I'm like, you know what the thing is? And I'm just like, I'm just going to talk over you. I'm going to talk over you louder and just let everyone know, hey, I'm going to be the fucking guy talking now. And every now and then you got to do it. And it's foreign for me. I don't like it. It doesn't feel. I just like a civilized world where we're like, oh, no, I'll talk and then you talk and then you talk and then he talk. That's the world I want to live in. I don't want to be in a world where I got to compete to like, I don't want to be in that world. But. Sometimes you find yourself in those situations, and uh, I think it's okay to, to you know, do whatever it is that you do. And I just, it doesn't fit on me, you know what I mean? I think some people think probably it does, because they're like, what are you talking about? You're fucking loudmouth every time I see you, or when you're doing comedy. You're like, yeah, I'm doing comedy, or I'm on a podcast. Like, I'm not, this isn't who I am normally. That's one thing about me, is that, when I'm not on stage or I'm not on a podcast or yeah, sometimes when I'm hanging out with friends, I try, I'm a, you know, I try to be really funny, but otherwise I'm just like, I'm like, yeah, we're all human beings. So I don't want to be funny all the time. I just sometimes just want to hang out and talk. And I just, you know, I played in this golf tournament and I'm playing with a lot of comedians, three, there was a foursome and we were all comedians. And all different kinds, you know, improv, sketch, stand up. And I'm like, I don't want to try and be funny today. I just want to golf and we can talk and have conversation. I mean, I can be funny, but it's just like when it gets into that, it's like, it's like the whole time. You know what I mean? It's the whole time. And I'm like, nah, I wait for my moments. And otherwise, I'm just going to chat because I like to chat. 
I think I might like chatting more than I do like making jokes. Mm. Is that boring? Fuck it. I don't give a shit. I want to be boring. That's something we've been talking to kids about. Like, they're like, I'm bored. And everyone has the, you have the idea of being like, no, you're not. Trust me. I've said it a number of times. Like, you're bored. Look around you. Look at how amazing the world is around you. You're not bored. Now I go, good. You should be bored. You know what you do in boredom? Find something. Make something. Create something. An idea. Whatever. Go be bored. That's where the best things come out of her. People who are bored. They don't know what's going on. Kids don't know shit. Oh. I want to mention a good friend of mine, Maddie Fontana. This is for people in Boston. People in Boston, December 26th at, I believe, Nick's Comedy Stop. Nick's Comedy Stop, December 26th. My boy, Maddie Fontana is performing it's going to be a great show if you're in boston december 26th day after christmas great day to go out and get laughs i wonder if the comedy clubs are open on christmas in la they are the comedy store is open 365 days a year which i always find is like interesting it's where my separation from work and i know people don't look at comedy as work sometimes and and real life is is like like I'm doing New Year's Eve in Portland. This is the first time I've ever performed on a New Year's Eve. The first time ever. Uh, and I just never have wanted to. I'm like, nah, New Year's Eve, I, I, you know, well, first of all, back in the day, I was bartending because you were making bank. Let me tell you this one time. I'm not proud of this, okay? All right. So if you've never bartended, here's some insider information. Most bartenders are stealing, okay? That's just what's going on. Now, a good bar manager or a good restaurant manager knows this and gives some leeway to their bartenders. Now, when I say they're stealing, I'm saying they're giving away free drinks. You know what I mean? You're giving away free drinks. Then you it's a slippery slope, okay? It's a slippery slope. So if you're giving away free drinks, sure. Then what some guys are doing is four guys come up. Now... <laughs> God, this is tough to say because do I think, do I believe in stealing? No. Is it happening? Yes. Can I break some stuff down for you? Sure. How about this? A well vodka, the cheapest vodka. If you go into a restaurant or a bar and you go, hey, man, let me get a vodka soda, right? Or a vodka tonic, vodka OJ, whatever. If you don't tell them a vodka, they're going to pour the well. That's the cheapest stuff. The place I worked, the cheapest bottle was $7 a bottle. And a drink costs $7. Now, depending on who was pouring out of that bottle, I think you're getting maybe 30 drinks out of that bottle. Do you get what I'm saying? That's a 290%. No, that's... Every time... So then every time you sell a drink, you bought enough for a bottle. So you make... The markup is like 3,000%. Whatever. I can't do that math, guys. I cannot do it. 30 times, you know, 30 times, that bottle gets paid for in one, one and a half drinks. If you, if you want to take in, like, uh, operations costs, electricity, you know, ice, all that glassware and stuff like that, two drinks, you pay for a bottle, maybe, okay? Um, or it pays for itself. So, yeah, sometimes, sometimes I was working the brunch shift, and I wasn't making no money, and guys would come in. And they were like waiting for a table. And they're like, hey, can we get five Bloody Marys? And you're like, yeah, sure. And you make five Bloody Marys. And it's $35. And they give you 40 bucks. And they're like, keep it. You might not ring it in. And you might just throw the 40 bucks in your tip jar. And now you're like, if you normally make 100 bucks on a brunch shift, which, you know, I used to have a really solid brunch business. <laughs> yeah, I just said that. Then you would... Now you're like, if you're making 110 bucks, now you made 150, boom. And that's, every now and then you're going to get like a money tip, but this, this, will, this is what bartenders will do. I'm just telling you the facts. Now, <clears throat> that, that's when you get real shady, real shady, you're ringing in every other drink. You know what I mean? That's real shady. If a place is crushing it, you're like, oh, if it's cash, you know, I don't know. I can't get into specifics, but. I think I was pretty specific. So everyone's stealing. I had a, I knew a guy 
Pete Johansson. He's a comedian, very funny guy, who used to bartend at uh, the Roxbury. Do you remember that SNL sketch back in the day with Chris Kattan? Um, anyway, it was this like he used to tell me like Tom Cruise would be sitting in the corner at a booth by himself drinking a water. He's like people be doing cocaine off the bar. He's like I watched a guy on Sunset Boulevard shoot a fucking M16 into the air. Like it was a crazy time. And his bartender, his bar manager would come over to him before a shift and say, "Hey, make sure you're taking a little for yourself tonight because if you're not taking a little, you're taking a lot." Okay? So that's like how they see it. They know it's drugs, guys. Okay? It's drugs. Do I know if pharmacists at CVS are stealing and selling? I don't know. Probably not. But they're dealing drugs. They're drug dealers. Bartenders are drug dealers. You know? There's going to be shadiness that happens. The profit margin is so high that it's it's not even supply and demand. It's addiction and demand. That's what's going on. It's like... Everybody is always going to want booze or drugs. Always. It's never going to stop. It's always going to be there. The markup is so high in restaurants and bars. We worked at a restaurant that it, their liquor license, there's different liquor licenses. You know, Some are just for bars, some are restaurants. And it, at our restaurant liquor license stated that you had to sell a certain amount more food than you did booze. And we used to do so much booze that every year we had to raise the price of food just to offset how much booze we were selling. So, like, they were crushing it. What the fuck was the... Where did I even start with this whole thing? I have no idea. Anyway. God damn it. You guys... See, here's the thing. You guys can just be like, Jay, you said this. I can't. What am I going to do? Stop and go back? No, I can't. That's the... This is one of the downfalls of not having other people here. No one's here to check me. Like, oh, you know what you're talking about was X. And then I could just talk about it. Different levels of stealing in that in that element. Oh, here was the other thing that some restaurants would do. They'd give you a tab. They would be like, you got 150 bucks to buy people drinks tonight. And you would have a... On, like, your computer, you have, like, a check that would be, like... They'd call it spill or... Friends of the friends of the restaurant, you know, so if you had regulars, you could buy them a drink. It's part of like that's how you run a good bar is like the people who come in all the time, you buy them a drink. Someone comes in for the first time or is super nice or super cute, you buy them a drink. You know what I mean? You you just do nice things and that's how you keep your bar business up and then you trust your bartenders. I oh God, I wish I could tell you where why I started this rant or this discussion so I could finish it. Maybe it'll come to me. In the meantime, I'm gonna tell you this one story. When I was bartending, so like I waited tables forever, and then I was like, "Man, I saw how much money the bartenders were making." I'm like, "I, I want to bartend." New Year's Eve, I told you I'd find it, you fucks. You didn't think I'd find it. Anyway, the reason I never worked New Year's Eves in comedy is because I'd be bartending them, and like that's where you make the most money. So when I first started bartending, you know, like once you get your teeth in there. Basically, when I got trained to bartend at this restaurant, the guy who trained me was basically he and the owner of our restaurant. He was a co-owner. The big owners lived in another state, and he just ran the restaurant. He was a general manager, and he was part owner. They, him and my bar manager, were stealing money from the business and manipulating the books and everything to the guys that lived out of state that had all the money. But they were still making money. We were just cranking. We just had like, we had a mojito bar, cash only. We had a sushi bar, cash only. We had a satellite bar, cash only. Like there were cash spots. We had a register behind the bar, just cash. Like the amount of money we were stealing. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So I got trained to bartend there. I was waiting tables. I wanted to bartend. They trained me. I start bartending. I get, I get. Sunday brunch and Monday nights. Those are the two shifts they give me. Now, Sunday brunch was, there was no brunch business at the bar. People might come in, grab a mimosa or a Bloody Mary waiting for their table. Right? That's what was going on. And then I would work Monday nights. And I was just like, how do I get more business in this bar? So what I would do is I would put out, across the bar, I would put out fork, knives, napkins with a menu at them. So then people come in, they're like, oh, can we eat in here? And I'm like, yeah, you can eat in here. And I started getting people coming in. I had like, we had like a 150 disc CD changer. I know, we were so ahead of the time. 
and I went through, lay, categorized all the CDs, and then printed out a list. So people come in, I'm like, anything you want to listen to? And I drop the list down and let them pick music. Then I would take syrup, and I put it in a bowl, and I mix it with Bailey's and Frangelico. So if they would get something, I'd be like, I got Bailey's and Frangelico syrup if you're interested. They're like, really? How much? And I'm like, it's five bucks, but it's delicious. Boom. I'm making upsells. We had sangria, red sangria. I would make white sangria, which if you've never had white, it's the best. I'd make white sangria, and I'd be like, just at the bar, though. We only do white sangria at the bar. And they're like, oh. And I started like building this. It got to the point where I was doing really well at brunch because I was cranking. And every now and then, I took some Bloody Mary money. Um, so they gave me these shifts. But when they trained me, so I would just work Sunday brunch and Monday nights. I didn't start taking that Bloody Mary money till later on. So this is what happened. I'm working a Monday night. These two girls come in. Very cute. One in, one is vibing with me really well. We're getting along. The other girl orders a calzone. We had these calzones at the time that were really nice. And the pepperoni was just pepperoni cheese. She goes, I'm allergic to nuts. Is there nuts in there? I'm like, no nuts in there. But we have pesto in one of the other ones. And she's like, there's no pesto? I'm like, no. Well, the kitchen messed up their order. Trust me when I tell you this was not on me. They messed up the order, and they 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 put pesto in her thing. And she bites into it, and then she looks at me. She goes, there's pesto in this. And I go, no, that's the pepperoni. And she goes, no, look. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm like, what can I do? And she's like, I got to go. I have to leave right now. And I'm like, what? And I'm looking at her friend, and her friend and I are vibing. And I'm like, ah, I'm so sorry. I'm like, we got the check. You're good. She's like, all right. So they're walking out, and I go out after. <laughs> I go out after him. I go to her friend. I'm like, hey, listen, I know your friend's in a bad spot, but, you know, like, can I get your number? And she's like, no, dick. My friend might die. And I was like, oh, yeah, all right. Next day, my owner, the guy who's stealing, he calls me. He's like, can you come into my office? And he said, and his office was in his apartment. He had, like, a really nice apartment that the restaurant paid for. So he was getting a salary, his apartment paid for, and a Porsche, a work car. Okay, guy was killing and he's stealing a fuck ton. I'll tell you how much you'll see how much they were stealing in the end. And you're gonna be like, holy shit. Of course, he was stealing, Jay. So he calls me to his office, which is his apartment, and we go in his bedroom and like he sits in it on the edge of his bed and I'm sitting in the chair and he goes, Jay, uh, a, a woman called the restaurant last night, said you followed her friend out and, and when she was potentially going to die. I was like, oh, yeah, is that, not, is that not a good vibe? Is that not a good thing? And he's like, no, you can't be doing that. I was like, yeah, I hear you. I understand that. I understand. And he was like, uh, I'm going to take Monday nights away from you. And I was like, ah, and I just got these Monday nights. He's like, you can keep the brunch shift, probably because no one else wanted it, but you're going to have to prove yourself again. I'm like, all right. And then I end up proving myself and getting my, my night shifts back. So this is what happened. When I get my night shifts, or start getting night shifts that are on the busier night shifts. My bar manager, who's stealing with this guy, says to me, here's the deal. When you work night shifts with us, we have two registers back here. This one is for cash. That one's for credit cards. When you get a cash one, you put it in here. But only ring in every other drink. And I was like, okay. And I don't, I know what's going on because I'm not an idiot. I know they're stealing. But. My, he's doing it with my manager of the restaurant, and I'm just like, oh, maybe they're doing this with the guys out of state, and they're just like, you know, they're beating the system. You know what I mean? They're just like, hey, trust me. I tried to buy this bodega around the corner from me, and by try to buy, I mean I had no, I went for a small business loan. I don't have the cash. You'd be like, you want to buy your bodega? What am I, a fucking mob boss? Anyway, I talked to that guy. He's stealing. Everyone's stealing everyone's skipping on taxes. That's what it was. So I'm like, oh, they must be just skimping on taxes. So I started getting those night shifts and you'd be hitting that. He would call it hitting the cash drawer. He's like, hey, make sure you're hitting that drawer. And I'm like, all right. And I, it wouldn't be every other for me. It'd be like one to four ratio, something like that, right? And so what would happen is at the end of the night, you print out like all your receipts and everything and you start like you have to pay off, like balance your drawers. And pay whatever it is that you owed to the house for, like, everything that you had done, you know? And then we'd count out our tips. Well, 
I would take the credit cards and do that, and then he would take the cash and handle that. And what would happen is I would get a, my cash tips, right, which on a Friday night would be something like between 250 to like 350 bucks. And then I would get an envelope, like a white envelope with cash in it, and that was from the cash drawer. Okay, that was my percentage, my cut. And I was just like, oh, look at this, man. It's fucking going top to bottom here, man. Everyone's getting a little bit of the action. And that would sometimes be low end 75, high end 200. You know, like there were nights we were making like, we were cranking. I mean, we were cranking. So we were making like, you know, 500 bucks, 400, fuck, you know, whatever. We were making good money for bartending. Um, so this guy, one one weekend had to go away. And he would work Friday and Saturday night, and then I would work one Friday night, and my other buddy would work the other Saturday night. And we all knew the system. It was everyone had to do the system. That's what you were doing. So he comes to us and he goes, "Listen, I'm going out out of town. You guys are going to be working both Friday and Saturday together." And I'm like, "Okay." Now I told you how much money we were making, right? He goes, "But you need to you need to hit that drawer, or the numbers are going to be so far off that it's going to look like I'm taking all this money." And we were like, all right. Now, normally what we'd be ringing on the drawer, the the one with credit cards, that we did some cash in there too, was like 2500 bucks on a Friday or Saturday night. Okay, that's what we were ringing. By the way, I later found out that all the managers, everybody was in on this except the main owners. Um, so what happened is, so we worked that Friday night together, right? Now, we never hit the drawer as hard as this guy did because – because he had more incentive. He was making more money than us, which you'll find out in a second. I was telling you, on a really good night, we were making like five bills. Normally, it was around like 375 to 425 somewhere in there. So we do this, me and my buddy. Now he takes the credit cards, and I'm doing the cash section the way my bar manager normally did. I start getting everything tilled, and I just start like crying, laughing. And my buddy's like, what's going on? I'm like, you, you are not going to believe how much money we're about to make. And he's like, why? We each made $1,200 that night. $1,200. Now, each, right? So we're making 12 each. That's 700 plus. So that's a difference of that other dude was making every Friday and Saturday night an extra $1,400. Or whatever he was given to, then he was given to the other guy and the other person. So let's say he's making an extra eight, six, an extra six hundred cash, twi- Friday and Saturday night. So an extra twelve hundred, fifty two weeks a year because he worked every single one. That's eighty thousand dollars a year cash. And this was going on a long time. I looked at him like, can you believe this? Now, you know when you can believe it when you find out that that dude had at one point he got a brand new Jag. And they had a brand new Forerunner, and then he turned the Jag in for like a turbo Porsche, and then he had two condos like, uh, like an hour north of L.A. <laughs> okay, and you're like, all right, dude, it doesn't look like this is adding up. You're a bartender. <sighs> anyway, so I kind of started going. Then we got going down that road. So then I kind of just always looked at bartending because that was my first bartending gig. I'm like, oh, everyone steals. This is what you do. So this one New Year's Eve, my friend calls me up and he's like, hey, man, I'm putting on this event in downtown L.A. I need 30 bartenders. So I started working for this guy. He was making like portable bars, these like steel satellite bars. We ended up that restaurant I worked at, bought one from him. And they were like these beautiful. They were really cool. Anyway, I worked for him like putting on events and stocking his like warehouse, all this different stuff. And he called me up for this one. He's like, do you want to work? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, all right, cool. I have like 30 bartenders. And there was this huge fountain in downtown LA, this big circular fountain. And then the bars were all set up around it. And it was supposed to be this huge event in downtown. Just checking my time in downtown for new year's Eve. And they were saying there was going to be 2000 people there and blah, blah, blah. So we're down there. We set up now catering gigs. You set up, you know, like you set up a ton and it usually, you know, we're so there were fifteen bars all next to each other, two bartenders each. And you just get paired up with people. So everyone sets up their own back bar, all their booze they need. 
I set it up this, with this dude. I'm like, what's up, man? I'm Jay. I'm like, where do you work? I tell him where I work. He's telling me where he works. We set up, and now we're sitting there. It's like seven, no one. Eight, no one. Nine, no. I mean, no one. And then around 9.30, people start trickling in. Then, then like, we got busy. Then it got fucking busy. And, like, every bar was cranking. And I said to this guy, I'm like, listen, man, I don't know how you do, but where I work, we take a little for ourselves. And he's like, hear you loud and clear, bro. And <laughs> what happened was, I'm not proud of this, but actually, I kind of am, which is weird. Kind of like, it's drugs, dude. You're stealing from drugs. And everyone's like, it's alcohol. No, it's not. No, it's not. Alcohol is drugs, okay? It's the same thing. And I'm not saying that because I haven't had a drink in 15 months. I'm saying it because it's a drug. It's a drug that the com- the government was like, all right, let's just make this legal because we can make money on it too. The tax, I mean, the tax alone, it's drugs. Cigarettes are drugs. Weed is drugs. It's all drugs. It's all the same shit. They just give it different names, okay? It's drugs. So it's dirty. The markup is high as fuck because you can't make it. You know what I mean? It's why grocery stores, you can make a fuck ton of money because you're not making lettuce. Are you making lettuce? No. You can buy shit. Everyone knows if you buy groceries and you cook at home, it's cheaper than going to a restaurant because at a restaurant, they're making the food for you. Okay? You can't make certain shit at home. Imagine if you can make the food. You get it? Obviously, you get this. I'm not fucking solving mysteries here. Anyway, L.A., the some liquor license in L.A., the latest you can go in L.A. is like 2 o'clock, but this was like a 1 o'clock thing. Midnight hit, and then it was till 1. Well, they gave us like fuck tons of bottled water too, right? So at 1 o'clock, they came by, and they took all of our cash drawers. Like everyone had a cash drawer. Like you got a drawer that night. I don't know. Maybe it had $300 in like 20s, 10s, and 5s, you know? So at the end of the night, they're going to – take out their 300 per drawer, right? And that's going to go away. And then whatever else is in there is what they sold, what you sold at your bar. We had a tip jar, you know? But they left, we had so much tips already in our tip thing that people kept coming up for drinks from one o'clock on. And no one was around to say, no, don't. Let me also tell you this. So this guy who ran it, he bought everything. He was running the whole deal. He had he rented all the bars. He rented all the equipment. Then he just had like cases of Absolute. We were getting so busy, we turned around back bar. We didn't have Absolute. And then behind the back bar, you'd walk in the fountain. You weren't like in the water, but like on the edge. And you would go around to other people's bars and like, I'm grabbing a bottle of vodka. And everyone's like, fine. And then someone would come by and like, you got Jack? Because it's like, even as organized as we were, you fucking, you weren't organized. You got this one dude who's making steel satellite bars out of some fucking garage space in Santa Monica. Like, you think he knows? He's a, he's just an addict. <laughs> Every He's just a guy who's like, knows there's money in booze. That's who he was. So let's just say all in. Let's say all in in booze he spent. Don't forget the markup is so crazy. Let's just say, what's a bottle of Absolute when you go to buy it? Like 28 bucks, 32 bucks. He's buying it all wholesale and buying it by the case. So let's say he's getting it for like 20, maybe 18. I have no clue. But like in three drinks, that bottle's paid off. So he's bought all this stuff. So once he collects all those cash drawers at 1 o'clock, he's probably with an assistant. So he, I remember him coming to my background like, you got your cash drawer? I'm like, yep. He's like, all right, bar's closed. We're like, all right. He goes, he collects 15 of those cash draws, counts his 300 per, right? He's somewhere, God knows where he is, counting that. So he counts that 300 per, making sure everything's good. He knows all his expenses. Now he's counting. Probably what he did was once he got past those expenses and then maybe 1,000 or 2,000 past that, he was like, all right, at least I made two grand. And then he could go back to like make sure everyone's doing their job. Well, guess how long that took? A lot longer than you think. For the next hour from one to two, we sold so much booze and bottled water out of our thing that, like, we just kept selling. And there was no one around regulating it. No one, it was New Year's Eve. You think any cops are like, let's make sure no one's, they're fucking out dealing with whatever else craziness is happening. We just cranked. And this dude came back at like 2 30. He's like, all right, man, everyone's got to break down. 
So then everyone had to break down their bar and get everything loaded up. I said to the dude when it was like 145, and I go, hey, just keep selling, and I'll just start sorting our tips. He's like, all right. We made $1,200 each. And I was like, you know, back then, as a stand-up, I wasn't making anything. You know what I mean? I probably was like, oh, my God. I would only been doing stand-up. I moved to New York in 2007, and I was six years into comedy. So this was like four years into comedy. I wasn't getting paid shit. I mean, I got some stuff. But anyway, that was like killer money. And I remember there were these two girls bartending next to us who were like adorable. And I kind of liked one. I didn't kind of. I definitely was interested in this girl, but I didn't think she was interested in me. And they were like, I'm like, how'd you do? They're like, we did great. I'm like, nice. She's like, yeah, we made like 350 And I just took a $50 bill. I'm like, oh, here you go. And she's like, what? I'm like, yeah, it's for you. <laughs> like, because we stole. We were thieves. We were not good people. And then I remember like walking past the homeless guy and being like, hey, man. And he's like, hey. And I just gave him a $20 bill and he didn't give a fuck. That's why I never worked New Year's. <laughs> man, I remember in high school. Or it was college. My high school girlfriend, who like I dated into my college. We dated for seven years. We dated for a long time. I don't know how many of you know this, but on the first date with my wife, on the first date with my wife, we're driving. We went for appetizers, appetizers, at this restaurant across from the Hollywood Improv. I had a show at the Improv, so I took her to that, and then we left there and went to the Magic Castle, which is like. A comedy club for magicians. So it's just like six different rooms where magic's happening. There's shows going on. It's it's dope. You got to dress up. And there's like a secret password to get into this. You have to go up to this owl and say the secret password. And the, the bookcase opens up. so how you get in. It's 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 awesome. It's a super cool. There's not a lot of magic clubs in the world. I think there's two. And one's in L.A. So we went there. Um. Anyway, on, on the drive from the west side of L.A. to down to uh, Hollywood, my wife now, first date, it's like, uh, you went to, you're from where again? And I told her Stoneham, Mass. She's like, oh, yeah, I went to college with a girl from Stoneham. And I'm like, yeah, I know exactly who this is because it was my girlfriend that she went to college with. And uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. And then she's just sitting there and she goes, and she spurts out her name she's like do you know and i go yeah i actually dated her for seven years of my life and she was like what <laughs> and i was like and i was like oh i didn't bring it up she brought it up and my high school girlfriend was beautiful smart fun everyone liked her she was the nicest i'm like oh this is like a win-win for me anyway what's the point of that New Year's Eve, first date, Magic Castle. I can't remember. Oh, that high school girlfriend. Yeah, we had like broke up a number of times. And I remember one New Year's Eve, we were broken up and we were at my friend's party and she was there and everyone was there and we we're all dressed up and having a good time. And I just couldn't take it. I'm, a, I'm an intense dude. I'm like, I can't take it, dude. I can't take being her. And I, I knew all of my friends were going to be like, if I bailed on New Year's to go home, they, could, they, wouldn't, they just weren't going to let me. So I, I had one friend, and I was like, I got to get out of here, dude. And he's like, what's the matter? I'm like, I'm too in love with her. I was just like, I was a tormented human being. I, I didn't know what love was or how to interpret love. Or how to accept it, how to give it. I didn't know anything. I was just like this broken human being from a very young age. And I always attribute to my parents and who knows. But um, I remember just being there and I looked at my friend. I'm like, I got to go, dude. Just cover for me. He's like, all right. And I bounced. And, you know, at parties like that, you could just, it could go 40 minutes before someone realizes you're gone. Or just like, oh, you're not in the same room as them. And then I got home and then my friend called. Like an hour later, they called and they're like, where are you? I'm like, I'm home, dude. And, like, guy friends are never going to be like, oh, shit, dude. Yeah, man, I can tell you're in pain. You know what I mean? They're going to be like, shut the fuck up, bitch. And I was like, no, I need to be home. Never been a huge New Year's fan. This is when I like New Year's. You didn't know there'd be a New Year's app this early. So what is this? The 12th? That means the 19th, the 26th. So 26th. Anyway, that's three weeks away. I remember... My house as a kid had a den. 
okay? A den. When you think den outside of foxes, what are you thinking? If you're thinking small room with a rug, that's what we had. It was this little tiny room. And, you know, I just remember being like 12, 13, 14, 11, 10, that age. 10 to like 14, 15. That's when I fucking loved New Year's Eve. I used to love having my whole family in the house. Like, I had older brothers and sisters, so, like, it was cool when they were home. Because, you know, when they get older, when you get older, you just want to leave. You don't, you don't want to be home for New Year's or any of the holidays. But I was young, so I loved when they were all home. It was, like, it was cool. You had your brothers and your sisters, and my great aunts would come over, and my nana would come over. We ordered Chinese food. And it was like a party was happening, but with just your family. And I loved it. I don't know what it is. Or why I'm like this, but I always loved, I always have loved family. Like, I always loved having family around. I like being a part of my family. You know, some people don't. Some people are like, no, nah, fuck that. I hate my family. I just loved it. I always loved being around my family. I loved having them around. I loved that we were all together. And I remember just, like, sitting on the floor of my den, my back to this couch, leaning up against it. The TV was on. Some bullshit countdown, probably with Dick Clark. And uh, everyone's in the kitchen getting Chinese food out and just being like, man, it's cold outside. I'm like, where else would I want to be? Like, I've always been a homebody. I don't want to fucking, what do I want to go out and be with a bunch of people? When I see people in Times Square, I'm just like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm, I don't give a shit if you're out there going, okay, boomer. That's the dumb... It's. I was probably the same way when I was younger towards people that were older. Possibly. If you're listening to me right now, knowing that I loved hanging out at home when I was 14 and shit. Now, was I sneaking out of my house to meet up with chicks? Yeah. But I always had this, like, respect for, like, what we were, like, the family element of our, of our, the, our dynamic. But I'll tell you, I just, like, uh, I can't understand people at New Year's Eve going to, like, Times Square. I'm like, what in the world are you celebrating? I don't know. I just feel like my celebration for that kind of stuff is like the week leading up to it. That week after Christmas for New Year's is so fun. It's just the best. Like, no one's working. It's slow. You know what I mean? Like, no one's hustling and bustling around. You don't need to get anything for anyone. In LA, especially, it's quiet because. No one's from here, so everybody leaves. We're stay here, man. I tell my friends, like, you going here for the holidays? I'm like, nah, man, I'm an L.A. family, dude. We stay here. We we go places. I love it. You know what else I'm finding out with these people in the OK Homer, Boomer, whatever the fuck you idiots say? You're just saying it because the person that you're saying it to is saying something that you won't, you don't agree with. So why don't you just let that person say something you don't agree with? Just be like, oh, OK. But you, everyone's got to chirp in. You know what's the most annoying thing as well? Everyone chirps in on social media, or YouTube especially, and it's their little little face thing, and there's no picture of them. There's nothing, and it's some fucking dumb name that connects them to nobody. It's just a, you know, it's a world of drive-by insults. You don't, no one knows who you are, and you don't care. You just, people love to shred hate. I love that week before New Year's. I like setting my goals. You have like a solid week, at least in my age now, close to a week. I get to be with my kids and my wife. I get quiet time. Like they have toys that they're just playing with and I'm sitting at the dining room table and I'm going over my goals for the year. I'm reflecting on moments from the year, goals for next year. We'll go to the beach. I love going to the beach. Like you always go somewhere. We'll go for a hike maybe. Ah, oh, it's the best. This time of the year. We're 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 still in the calm. I'm lucky. My wife is amazing as far as like gifts for like family and kids. She gets everything. And now I'm just kinda like there's I don't have anyone else in my my life that I'm buying gifts for. Nobody nobody wants gifts from me. Do you guys want gifts from me? Um so I just need to get my wife something and I'm just like, I don't even know what the fuck to get her. Ah, oh, that was the thing. Will you guys do me a favor? Today's the twelfth. Next week is the 19th. The Christmas special is going to come out on the 17th. For next week's episode, 
please send me some Christmas memories. Send me your Christmas memories. I want to talk about them. That's what I want to do next week. I'll make an Instagram post. I'll, you know what? I'll do it right now. I'll do it right now. Just send me your goddamn Christmas memories. Like someone has sent me one and I want to talk about it. Let's see here. Recording this week's podcast right now. You know what I want for next week's podcast? Christmas memories. Send them to me. Email holiday bakery production to Gmail. Hit DM me here on Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Hit me up with some Christmas memories and some Christmas traditions. Are there things you do in your family? Let's discuss them. I want to discuss your Christmas stuffies. Don't be a fucking puss. I'm not doing that one. I don't like, even though puss is like not a terrible word, I don't want to put that on social media. Yo, I'm recording the podcast right now. This is this week's episode, and I want to get Christmas memories, Christmas traditions, traditions, Christmas stories. Share them with me. Share them with me. Send them to me. Email, DM me, Holiday Bakery Productions at Gmail. Send. Done. All right. That's it. Close to an hour. Send me your Christmas stories and memories and traditions. I want to talk about them both. The special will come out next week, the 17th. That's the hope. That's the goal. I'm going to be posting on social media. What the fuck ever. Send me your stuff. I love you guys. I appreciate you listening. I appreciate you watching. I appreciate you commenting. I appreciate you sharing. I can't do anything without you guys doing all that. Talk to you next week. Thank you.